Um, this has been a uh, cool voyage I've had. Um, I got to meet Gene and um, uh, Sishu Chen was at one point about, about 12, 13 years ago uh, when they bought one of their first thermal mass spectrometers and I did a training course for them. Uh, since then, we've collab we had collaborated with about 22 papers we published together okay, in plant biology. Uh, I want to say thank you to Gene and all the other grad students. Stand up, stand up, yes. Uh, who have taught me a lot of plant biology. Okay, I'm a physical chemist originally. I'm a mass spectrometrist, a chromatographer. I am by no means a biologist. I've had a great opportunity to learn that biology through our publications in proteomics, genomics, and metabolomics. So today I want to talk a little bit about a mass spectrometry focus, okay? Uh, we've already had a wonderful talk by Katie about columns. I'm going to touch a little bit and I'm going to expand into a few columns of hers, okay? Now, am I too far away? Am I done, Katie? The power's on. There we go. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Something to speak for a second. Okay. So, um, Katie gave a wonderful introduction to metabolomics, and I really can't compare with her. And we we have all done you know, talking about metabolomics is the measurement, the quantitative measurement of the metabolites. Okay, of the small molecules that are in a system. Okay, trying to deduce what is actually going on. What is the effects of the genomics, the proteomics, the environment, and the lives that those systems are experiencing, okay, and actually measure those final effects. Okay, now, a lot of questions come up is, why is proteomics 10, 15, 20 years further than metabolomics, okay? Proteomics has a cool thing. We digest all proteins into peptides, and this gives us a common chemistry that we don't have in metabolomics. Metabolomics, you saw the number of classes that Katie was talking about with all different physiochemical properties, okay? So rather than one C18 separation in positive mode with known fragmentation and the literature having over thousands of papers published on those fragmentation patterns, we're left with a complex evolution of chromatography, okay? So in work I did with Bishwa here, I was, we were able to do gas chromatography to see the very uh, extremely nonpolars, okay? Things that do not charge in solution at all and are not amendable to LCMS, okay? The other end of that separation is ion exchange, okay? Thermo has several systems like the, um, is it the IC6000, Drew? Is our main, is our high end LC system or ICS six thousand? Yep. So if you want to talk about IC separations, we hook them very easily up to the mass spec. Drew can help you out with that. Okay. Katie's already done a brilliant job of covering hillock and reverse phase. Okay. And long chain hydrophobic, the C thirty with a different mobile phase for doing lipidomics. Okay. If we're doing GC, GCMS, we're gonna need EICI. If we're doing um, LCMS, we're probably using electrospray, but we can do a lot more of the semipolars with APCI, okay? Fragmentation of the literature is super rich in positive ion mode since about the 1960s, okay? Positive ion mode covers about 98% of the known publications, okay? Less than 2% of all publications cover negative ion mode. The only reason is, no one wants to be the first. It's much easier to do positive ion fragmentation research because there's already a wealth of other papers out there to build off of, okay? So I want that clear that negative ion is just as reproducible, it is explainable, it's just not as well known historically. So 
first step, obviously, is quantification. Can we see differences? But the question then is, if I quantify a peak, what is that peak? And this is where the metabolomics complexity comes in, okay? We have, we've typically have five to seven levels identified depending upon which literature you're looking at, okay? I usually go with the five level model. Level one is a unique feature. A feature means an LC peak with a particular mass to charge ratio at a particular retention time. The better the chromatography we do, the more features we can see, okay? Number one. Number two, the longer the chromatogram, the more time the mass spec has to measure those features. And it's purely linear. The longer you spend running that sample, the more peaks you're gonna find. End of story. That is a level one. That is a mass spectrometer chromatographer's approach to metabolomics. Level two is when we take that known mass to charge ratio and we examine it chemically, charge state, adducts, isotopes, okay? Here, we generate a chemical composition, but a chemical composition is not a structure, it's a formula. We know there can be anywhere from several to several hundred to eight or 10,000 different structures with the exact same chemical composition. So level three is when we take that accurate mass precursor, we search against literature, libraries and databases, and we create a list of possible compounds. Step four is where we start to get excited. This is when we take, and we take the MSMS we acquired in a data dependent scan, and we match it against those structures, okay? And we attach some kind of quality score to say, which are the most believable matches? Which structures can I believe? Ultimately though, we need to reach level one, which is a purchase of a reference standard where we rerun it with the exact same chromatography to match retention time. We're gonna match it by precursor mass and we're gonna match it under identical fragmentation conditions. And now we have a level one. Now, it is important to understand the difference between a reference standard and a purchase standard, okay? I purchased a lot of standards from Sigma, okay? I'm not gonna knock Sigma, they're an awesome chemical company. The amount of stuff they sell, the quality is extremely high, okay? But out of six or 700 compounds I purchased, 500 are correct. I typically see about a 10 to 20% error rate in purchased compounds. That is different than a reference standard. A reference standard will have Infrared, NMR, okay, activity measurements. It'll have other pieces of biochemical or analytical chemistry techniques to validate its structure. And in the end, we agree upon its structure as that identical particular chemical, and we assign a purity to say how good is it as a reference standard. That's when you change from buying from Sigma to buying from Seroliant or from Cambridge Isotopes Labs. Now you're buying certified reference standards. And unfortunately, your cost goes way up, okay? Typically, you're gonna pay, you're gonna pay about $10 for a um, purchase compound. You're gonna pay about 40 to 60, $80 for a reference compound, okay? And if you're talking about looking for six to 700 reference compounds, you're now you're talking eight or $9,000 for your purchase standards, and you're probably talking six or $80,000 for your certified reference standards. You can quickly build up an expensive research project. Okay, now, metabolomics as a whole really involves a few simple steps. The first one is sample selection, sample design. We wanna differentiate between either an A versus B or sets of conditions, okay? Our compound discover software you're gonna see me use throughout this lecture, compound discover 3.0 or three later versions, okay? Allows us to define as many study factors as we want. A study factor is anything that we can differentiate one sample from another. 
I can look yeah. at, from a plant, I can look at roots versus leaves, leaves versus seeds. I can look at people by male versus female. I can look at people by age groups. I can look at people by their environment they live in. Anything I can differentiate and subgroup becomes a study factor. Okay. The nice thing is we're, we're measuring quantitative peaks and then we're assigning them to different conditions for exploration. So we don't need to know our study factors up ahead of time if we're building an experiment on the fly. Okay. Workflows are going to be saying, what options do we want to search for? And then sample types, pretty much controls versus unknowns. Okay. So we could do a control versus unknown typical study, wild type versus natural, environmental. Or we could do control versus control B, C, D, and E if we're trying to do method development. Okay. No matter what, the basic three steps amount to I'm going to create an extract and ion chromatogram of that particular chemical. Extract ion chromatogram is just a particular mass plotted over time to make an LC peak that we can integrate and get the peak area for. And in this case, you can see different classes of organisms producing different heights. And we can see blue being tall versus orange being shorter, about two or three to one difference. Is that visually clear that everyone can see those differences? Okay. That particular chromatogram allows me to calculate a ratio. That chromatogram came from a spectra. It came from a particular chemical above the noise being plotted over time by the software. The real question, though, comes in is, what do we do with that peak? The first question we ask is, what is it? So I'm going to talk about different ways that we can identify that LC chromatographic peak and use his area for actual biology. I'm going to talk what kind of levels of identification do we have available to us. That's important to get to the confidence of that assignment. Because anyone can write a name, but the name's only useful if we can quantify what its quality is. And lastly, we're going to say, what is our change and what is our confidence in that change? Okay, What is the ratio and what is the confidence? Like a p-value. Now, let's be realistic. I see tons of researchers get excited. Craig, I saw height 1 and I saw height 1.5. Generally, you're looking for a change of 10x or better to take a idea into a clinical setting. So when, when I get excited is when I see things that are changing 10x, because I know that my research now could produce a clinical result in 10 or 12 years that is useful to a doctor. When I'm looking at changes of 1 versus 1.5, that's a real tough change to move from the research lab to the clinical world. That's more of a lead that could produce more biochemistry studies in the future. Now, is that the opinion of Thermo Fisher? No, that's the opinion of Craig Dufresne. That is my personal opinion. Take it for what it's worth. It's offered free of charge. Okay, so how do we get that cool LC peak? We're going to do one of three experiments. The first experiment we're going to do is untargeted metabolomics. Okay. This is the area that Thermo excelled in in the last 15 years, okay? We're gonna do some sample prep. Katie, is there anyone at Thermo who knows a lot about sample prep? Katie lives sample prep. Katie has a whole bunch of friends at Pierce who live sample prep for a living, okay? Between the Pierce side of Thermo, the CCS side of Thermo, we know prep, okay? I can't do anything in a separation if I don't have a clear sample without particulate. If I don't have those two pieces, I'm done because I'm going to clog my LC column and I'm going to be calling Katie with another $1,000 in my pocket. Okay. Now, Katie talked a lot about separations. Katie, what's the world's greatest LC ever sold? And what is that model called? The vanquish. We're going to vanquish everybody else. 
Okay. We're going to vanquish the competition. We're going to vanquish your nightmares. Okay. Is the vanquish LC the best? Yes. I can honestly say that. Even, even if I didn't work for Thermal, I would know that. And we own a lot of different vanquishes that Drew can help you purchase depending upon what kind of capabilities you want. Okay. I love the Vanquish Horizon. I can save a little bit of money by Van Vanquish Flex, which is still a good system at a thousand bar. Okay, it meets my needs. Okay, Katie talked a lot of columns. I generally live my life with three columns: Hypersil, Gold, Vanquish AQ. Okay, the Vanquish AQ gets me a little better separation of my hydrophilics that I struggle with a bit of my reverse phase. Okay, AccuCore Amide Hillock. This is my favorite Hillock. Okay, hillock columns are, are, you'll see all those different modifiers. The problem is, I'm going to be looking at about a thousand different compounds in my hillock separation. So if I pick a column that works better for my, for my hydrophobics, my hydrophilics change. If I move to my hydrophilics, my hydrophobics change. If I go in the middle, a little each way. Okay, the amide column, the amide column holds up well, it's easy to use, and it gives me a pretty good balance. Okay, now, I love our mixed mode columns. Anyone's ever used a glycan pack, which is a either reverse phase with anion exchange or hillock with anion exchange or the trinity columns where we mix anion exchange, cation exchange with hillock or anion exchange, cation exchange with reverse phase. Those are some cool columns, okay? They, they are a little more delicate. You gotta be a little more careful with them, but they do give you some cool separations, okay? And I've started exploring them in the last two, three years and are, are working out um, quantitation on them to see which ones I like. The C30 opens up my lipids, okay? And gives me a separations on the very, the very hydrophobic end of the small molecules that I don't run via GC, GCMS. I'm gonna detect with any Orbitrap, okay? IQX is my favorite for metabolomics. You've got a QE, you're fine. You got a Ascend, you're awesome, okay? I need high mass accuracy. You're not gonna do metabolomics untargeted on a triple or on a ion trap. You don't have the mass accuracy to give you the selectivity to make an LC peak XIC. You're going to need an Orby. But honestly, I'm not going to be caring which Orby you buy. Now, people say, well, the, the more money you spend, the better the instrument. Yes, that is totally true. Okay. If you can swing and ascend, you're going to get a lot better data. But you can do it on a QE as a starting point and work your way up. Okay. Data processing. Okay. Your whole life is about compound discoverer. Compound discoverer drives all these other applications by converting data into peaks, and then the peaks operate with the different ways to identify we'll talk about. Okay, and then reporting. Now, this workflow is all about what metabolites are found in my particular system. Okay, humans produce about 7,000 small molecules, we think, is the number I, I always hear. Plants, about 220, 250,000 small molecules, okay. Your choice of going untargeted is best when you're working with a system outside of the norm. You're doing human metabolomics, you can probably do pretty good targeted work. You're doing plants, you're doing bacteria, you're doing nematodes, they may see very, very different small molecules that may not appear in a targeted. And you want to figure out your particular system, what are you looking at? Now, I want this clear. This is about, ooh, that was painful. This is about 10 times harder than doing targeted metabolomics. Okay. The software runs just as easily, the results come up. But you're gonna spend more time saying, is this the correct result? 
because you have to judge the confidence of your identification, which has already been done in a targeted experiment. And that's where the difficulty comes and you slow down. Okay, now, this is a picture inside the Orbitrap IQX. Okay, he's a hybrid instrument. Okay, he is basically a Q Exactive Orbi Explorers on the front end, and he's got an ion trap on the back end. Okay, this allows him to do, instead of just our normal HCD fragmentation, ion trap resonance excitation and MS to the end. Okay. The IQX is one of the softest front ends of any of the thermo instruments. It doesn't fragment delicate molecules, which makes it easier to explore metabolomics with. It's very hard when you take a small molecule and you accidentally crack it into two pieces. And now you're not sure if you're looking at a one, two smalls or one big. It makes your life a little more difficult. It is extremely fast, okay? Like the Explorers, it's got the high end Orbi for the fastest possible scan speeds at a given resolution. It has the ion trap for doing MS to the N for complex molecules, okay? This is never my go-to. This is my backup. I'll, I'll run 90% of my small molecules via MSMS and solve my problem. I get the 10% where, where my MSMS does not give me the fragments to distinguish the way I need. And now I do MS to the third or MS to the fourth trees. And I start to break up those complex isomers into their proper bins. And it's got real-time library search. We can load the library search function onto the mass spec and make choices about our MS, MS quality or MSN quality on the fly, okay? And that's just way cool. You, do you need this to do the work? No. Will this life take your life forward? Yes, kind of like Buzz Lightyear. This will take you to infinity and beyond. Okay, now, targeted metabolomics. Targeted metabolomics could use a triple quad or it could use an Orbi, okay? A lot of people say, you know, Craig, I really want to do targeted. Unfortunately, all they own is an Orbi. Guess what? An Orbi is a triple quad on steroids when it comes to targeted metabolomics, okay? The, the Orbi will do actual better than the triple quad comps because your selectivity is way higher than the triple, okay? So the triple could do targeted, or the Orbi can do untargeted and targeted, your choice, okay? You're gonna use the same separation, the same sample prep. You're gonna process though, not with compound discover because we're not exploring anymore. Now we're just quantifying with a program like trace finder. <coughs> okay. You're gonna quantify known metabolites. This means you've gotta have a list of what's interesting, and you've got to have plates with those compounds in them. Because you've got to establish retention times and libraries to use these. Okay, and I'm gonna talk about how we do that a little later. Okay. This though makes your data analysis much easier. Once click, and you've got your peak areas, a second click, you've got your ratios, and you're ready to go. And because you built them on known metabolites, on certified reference standards, you don't have to explore your way through that list of steps. Lastly is semi-targeted. This is where I'm gonna use an Orbi trap and I'm gonna build in all the targeted metabolites I know. So Jin's gonna say, Craig, here is 15 trays I bought from Sigma. There's 800 metabolites. I'm gonna put them into my mass spectrometer. I'm gonna go look for them. But whenever one of my knowns is not eluding, I'm just gonna see what else is there and do data dependency on the fly, okay? This is about continuous improvement, okay? What I wanna do is I wanna keep finding new compounds and putting them back into my targeted metabolomics workflow. 
And eventually, with enough Orbi work, this will solve all my pathways that I need to find. Do we need to find every metabolite that plant makes? No. We need to find the metabolites that are key to the pathways, which allow us to explain the biology. Okay. So I always think of semi-targeted as what do I know and what am I finding new so I can continuously improve my targeted method with more and more peaks. Now, chromatography systems. Okay. Is it possible to inject positive and negative in one injection? Yes. Is it mentally easy? No. If you're, if you're solid on your chromatography and mass spec and you do metabolomics for a while, I have no problem with you mixing positive and negative into one run. When you're first starting, okay, and actually through my, my whole 15 years, I love to do two injections, one pause and one neg. That way there's no confusion about my data dependency setup and it's just much easier to visualize and talk about. Okay, so what it could be done in one injection, no problem. So I'm gonna do the hillock injection that Katie talked about, okay. I'm gonna, same exact buffer she loves, okay. I've been using this for years. <laughs> we, we, we provided the slides about eight years ago, and that's why you see a commonality. Acucor amide, I love that column. He's easy to use, he's robust, he holds up well, okay. 400 microliters, 300, 500, I don't care. 400 works great for the HESI source that appears on every thermo mass spec, okay. I'm gonna scan from 50 to 750 for my hillock. Hillock molecules are generally, if, if they're above 500, that's a rarity. So I don't need to scan high for those guys because they're very polar, they're very small, okay. Please remember, water becomes a strong solvent in hillock because it's reverse phase, reversed. So you got to make sure your samples are dissolved in organic or they're going to run right through the column and you're not going to retain. Biggest mistake customers make when they first tackle hillock. Okay. Now, 25 years ago, hillock sucked. Their, hillock has a bad name. You talk to chromatographers hillock, and they're like, no way. No way. The retention times are not reproducible. 25 years ago, they weren't. The early hillock columns had a lot of problems. Starting in about 2000, 2003, Okay, Agilent, Thermal, Waters, we all kind of made a few key discoveries and we brought Hillock back and Hillock works great. I have no problem with retention times, columns equilibrate, they hold up well, okay, I love Hillock. Reverse phase for my semipolars, okay, my bigger molecules. Notice that I scan up higher because I start to see compounds in the 8, 900, these huge natural products that are very pathway specific in biology, okay? Same exact mobile phase, just run backwards, okay? And then I'm gonna tackle my lipids, okay? So I'm gonna extract into organic my hillock compounds, I'm gonna extract into aqueous my reverse phase compounds, I'm gonna extract into chloroform methanol, okay, my lipids, my fatty acids. Okay, now, <laughs> please don't ask me a lot of questions. I run these beautiful, I fragment these beautiful, I compound discover these beautiful. I am not a lipid guy. I can't speak the language, the biology of lipids. It's my, it's my one weak area as a chemist, okay? Notice the mobile phase changes from acetonitrile water to IPA. You need, a, you need a strong solvent like isopropanol to get these lipids off of the column, okay? You're gonna be scanning up higher because these lipids are large structures. Okay, and you're gonna remember, do not chill the auto sampler or your lipid samples will fall right out of solution and you'll be injecting goo instead of liquid. Okay. Six injections. Well, Katie, Drew, that's a lot of instrument time, right? Yes. Drew, what if we, ha what if we had three mass specs? Could we shoot fast? Could you sell them three mass spectrometers? You'd be very happy. Mass specs have gotten so cheap nowadays, you might as well just buy three or four, or in this case, six, and run them all in parallel. That'd be really awesome. And Thermo would help you do that. Now, I wanna show an example. This is a reverse phase injection, okay? Um, this is not too bad. This is a 15 minute gradient, okay? I'm on my hypersil 
gold column. I'm going from my water to my acetonitrile, a little ammonium formate to buffer, a little formic acid to keep my chromatographic peak shape nice. Okay. If you first look, you're like, hmm, there's about 20 compounds there. Well, once you look at what looks like noise, there's still about 110 compounds that are in the noise alone. Okay. These peaks that look like tiny are produce beautiful LC peaks when plotted. Okay. Typically, I'm, I'm seeing about four orders of magnitude currently in data dependent on the Orbi that I can deal with. Okay. Customers ask me, Craig, why haven't we gone to low flow? The problem in metabolomics is not sensitivity, it's dynamic range. Okay. If I, I can't take this sample and dilute it to see these little peaks because my other peaks are still flooding the chromatography. Okay, metabolomics generally have plenty of sample. Dynamic range is tough. Okay. Right now I'm solving about four orders. People are claiming six. Six I can do in a target experiment. And data dependency, about four. Pretty reliable with data that I'm not embarrassed of. Okay. Here's an example of my AccuCore C30 separation. Okay. This, this has a little over 17,000 lipids that were found in it, okay, as distinct molecules. Of those 17,000, I identified a little over 1,800. This is why I spend nights crying if I care about the sample, okay? The number of compounds I can quantify is generally 10 times the number of compounds I can assign. And that's always been the bottleneck that we're slowly improving with the different data analysis I'll talk about. Okay. So once we have that data, what do we do with it? Okay, we're going to run it through Compound Discoverer. Okay, now, Compound Discoverer and Proteome Discoverer have a common base. Yes, Craig, the word Discoverer. They're the same basic code applied in two different ways. The only between CD and PD is CD uses small molecule software to assign the structure. Proteome Discover uses databases like Sequest or Mascot to assign the structure. But creating the extracted ion chromatogram, the statistics, the ratios, it's all the same. Because all that chromatogram is is an M over Z over time with a window. What you identify it with is where it gets different. Okay, now. I do want to mention Compound Discover and Proton Discover are both restricted open source. What does that mean? It's a little strange term. Thermo owns the code and the rights to Compound Discover and Proton Discover. But the results files are totally open source SQLite databases. Okay. When you get a PD result file out or a CD result file, same exact thing, the, the output. That is totally an open source database. Thermo has it, offers courses generally every year, and we actually teach you for two days how to program a it. Okay. it is completely open to you. All the nodes that do all these processing steps is all freely available code that you can modify, and you can write your own. Secondly, CD and PD are both client servers. You only pay the license to do the search. Well, you can install the software as many times anywhere you want and view the results and do the statistics and do the pictures and do the biology. Okay. So it's only the actual search function that's licensed. Now, you're going to do a few steps. I kind of showed you an earlier picture. We're going to define a workflow and program this Discover and Compound Discover come with a large number of workflows already built, depending on what you want to do. Okay. You could grab any of them, grab the one that sounds close to what you're interested in, and you modify from there. Okay. You're going to identify the workflow, which defines the type of data you want and the type of results. You're then going to put the samples into as many groups as you can. And then you're going to hit run and let the thing run. Now, I want something clear. Before anyone called this, God, Craig, Compound Discoverer seems slow. My last data set was 400 gigabytes of raw data, okay, generating a little over 171,000 peaks that Compound Discoverer processed 
across 130 injections, okay? If I did that by hand, I'd be there until Buck Rogers came back from the world, okay? Just keep it track. Compound Discover did take two days, but it was two days of me you not know, being pain. So we are gonna produce thousands of features, maybe tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of features, just an M over Z over time that creates an LC peak that has a shape which looks believable it would not embarrass a chromatographer, okay? <clears throat> then Compound Discoverer, okay, is gonna take and do as many different search functions as you tell it. And your goal is to find as many ways possible to identify your molecule using accurate mass and MSMS information that the mass spec provided. The more ways you find it, the higher confidence goes up. Okay, and when you come to a compound, you're going to click on his associated tables and you're going to see all the different ways he was identified. And now we can say which of those identifications was good and what of those five levels did I obtain? Okay, so what can we do? We can search MZ Cloud. Katie, do you know the four letter F word Thermo never uses in public? It's the F R E E. I'm not, see, she's good still. She can, I can't even get the word out of my throat anymore. Except MZ Cloud. MZ Cloud is one of the coolest free resources Thermo gives you. Okay. It is a database, okay, based upon a program called Mass Frontier, developed by Robert Mistrick in the Czech Republic. Okay. <clears throat> With 2.8 million spectra in it based off reference standards. Thermo owns a company called Maybridge Pharmaceutical. Okay, it's, it's never talked about in public. Okay, it is a screening company. They own 58,000 pure standards and they shipped a pallet of them to San Jose. And over the last 10 years, we grab a standard and we run on the mass spec under every possible condition. And we build it into MZ Cloud and we provide that free of charge to anyone who wants to search it. Okay. This is essentially level one identifications. Okay. And the cool part is no matter what mass spec you are on, we collected these spectra under every condition. So let's say, Craig, well, they're all Orbi spectra, correct but they're Orbi spectra from zero collision energy to 200 electron volts. So let's say I have a QTOF. Oh, I understand, Craig, man, I made a mistake. I bought that QTOF downstairs. Okay, I want to put it to good use. Don't worry, Thermo appreciates you. And what all you're going to do is you're going to pick one compound that's in our spectral library, and you're going to run it on the QTOF under the conditions the QTOF says are default. And then you're going to search that against MZ Cloud, and you're going to say, oh, QTOF basic is 40 electron volts on the Orbi. And now you know how to run all your QTOF data through MZ Cloud, okay? Because you know the conversion factor from the QTOF world to the thermal world, okay? Now, this is growing every day by leaps and bounds, okay? As Thermo and other contributors that are all referenced are adding more and more compounds. Eventually, this will solve metabolomics. I don't know what I mean by the word eventually, though. I don't know if that's the next 10 years or that's my lifetime before or my children's lifetime. Okay. The key is, is if your organism is not interesting to everybody else, you go into MZ Cloud and there's a paper that uh, Wei, what was Wei's last name? Zhang? Wei? Wei Zhu? Wei Zhu collaborated with us, okay? And MZ Cloud's got a th hundreds of thousands of compounds, but doesn't have a lot of plant compounds, okay? So in that sense, he was getting about 10% of his IDs out of MZ Cloud, not because of problems with the instrument, but because the people who had put in those compounds just weren't interested in plants, okay? And now we're starting to contribute plant data, okay? ChemSpider is a chemical structure database. This is not mass spectrometry. This is just structures. Take example, Sigma. Sigma takes their whole catalog and loads it into ChemSpider. 
structure, names, synonyms, molecular weights, physical properties. All of this comes into chem structure, but these are just structures and molecular weights. They're not MSMS. They can't give us that level one ID we're looking for that something like MZ Cloud can. MZ Vault is spectral libraries. Spectral libraries are a particular example of MZ Cloud. MZ Cloud builds spectral trees, a full scan, an MS2, CID, an MS2, HCD, an MS3, an MS4, an MS5. They are spectral libraries linked together. So I always tell customers, start off building spectral libraries, but eventually you want to build spectral trees, which is much more powerful. Search lists are local databases. They're Excel files. They, they might give me retention time. They might give me master charge. Okay, They are semi-targeted. Okay, I, I would mass list not only to my search result, but to my instrument method. So I'm choosing the correct peaks that I'm eventually going to search. So here's an example of MZ Cloud. Okay. We take this compound and MZ Cloud identifies it as acetyl L carnitine. Okay. With a very high MZ Cloud score. And when you look at the raw MS2 and the reference MS2 from MZ Cloud, they're an exact match. Is that a level one search? No, it's a level two. I've got an exact MS2 match, but do I have the reference standard with the exact same retention time? No, that'd be my next step. Now I know which one to buy. I purchase it, I run it, and it gives me the exact same peak. Chem Spider will give you you a long list of structures based upon a common molecular weight. Okay. But it's not a identification. And it's not even a scoring because there's no MSMS involved. Okay. You can always do a chemical composition. Okay. We can use our exact mass and fine structure to produce chemical compositions. So we know exactly what the formula is. But a formula, again, is not structure. That's what we need to reach always. Okay. And in this case, you're seeing this beautiful, this is where we love high res, where we can, where we can take two C13s, separate them from the sulfur 34. Okay. I can do that in real time on the Orbian chromatography quite easily. Okay. Run the resolution up at a 250,000. You can find structure quite easily, and it looks really nice. Okay. These chemical compositions load into our results. And then hopefully, if we can have a level one or level two ID, we can assign a name. What happens when we have all these different ways to identify? We list them under annotations. And that can tell you what is the source of this identification so you can group into your different qualities for your literature. Reporting. Okay, now, local spectral libraries. This is when we want to move from the grad student completed their paper to the grad student wanting to make the next graduate student's life easier, okay, where your research group builds up over time. Because what you want to do is every time you successfully identify something, you want to build that experimental data into the library, okay? So for example, here at U of F, I collaborated, okay? We purchased a little over 600 plant compounds unique to Rabidopsis, which are known important biological pathway identifiers, okay? Wei Zhu and a few of his students, and Yang Yan, Yan, who went back to China, right? Yes. First of all, spent a lot of time getting those chemicals into solution. Okay, I, I want to make, I don't want that sound simplistic. When you have 600 different powders, you get them all into solution successfully, that's a major step forward. Okay, then they ship them to me. And one at a time, I ran each compound 
on the mass spectrometer singly. Okay. And we produced a really cool flowchart. Okay. So we start off with these real standards. And one at a time, we inject them. We do a full scan and we do a day dependent MSMS. And the first question we ask is Is there an explainable precursor? Okay, hopefully, I expect to see one big LC peak. I cross my fingers, I see one big LC peak. Usually, we saw either one or up to five or six generally. Okay, because a lot of these compounds were not pure standards. Okay. For the big LC peak, when I take his known structure and I predict an M plus H in positive mode or an M minus H in negative mode, can I match that with the proper st structure? If I am, I'm, I'm awesome. Okay. Then we say, is there an MS2 that was chosen by data dependency? If there is, are the fragments defining the structure? Can we break that structure into pieces and assign those fragments by accurate mass and explain his structure. If there was no MS2, I just take that sample, I re-inject it with a targeted PRM. PRM is the orbital equivalent of SRM, if you're familiar with a triple quad. Okay, that way I guarantee the MS2 took place. But what if the fragments aren't good enough? <coughs> then we re-inject with a targeted at different collision energies trying to find the optimal collision energy for that particular molecule. When we do, when we get a precursor that's explainable, we get an MS2 that's optimal, then we add them to the library. Okay. Out of 544, I think we got 502 of them into the library successfully. Generally, when I do this kind of library building, I generally lose about 5 to 10% of them. They won't go into solution. They won't chromatograph. They won't ionize. They ionize, but they won't fragment. Or they fragment, but the fragments don't make any sense at all. All of those steps can happen incorrectly, and that's where we have this beautiful flow chart to say, how do we handle those, or when do we give up? Okay. Now, my goal would then, once you have a library, I then could take that library of known chemicals and I can go back to my chromatography. And now I can do what Katie was talking about, which is application specific chromatography. Okay. Because it's just any good to try to optimize a column with Katie over the phone if we don't know what chemicals we're interested in. So we can say, you know, I've got these 450 working well, these 50 I'm struggling with, what can I do to my column selectivity to find those other 50? So here's an example, okay. We got Jehorzine. Je do I pronounce that word, Jehorzine? Oh, okay, good. I want me, if a plant biologist doesn't get it right, then I'm not gonna worry about Jehorzine. Okay, we, we find his precursor as a nice LC peak. We match theory by molecular weight on the Orbi. Okay, we fragment him. Okay, at a setting of 20, which works for a lot of small molecules, we barely touch him. We go to 30, we start fragmenting him. At 40, we find our optimal. We, we remove the precursor just almost down to zero. We have a nicely balanced MSMS. Now, in this case, we actually put all three spectra into the MZ vault because compound discoverer is smart enough to say, huh, when I ran that particular compound, it gave me an energy of 35. And it just takes the 30 and 40 spectra, average them together, and gives us 35 spectra. Okay, by storing it under all the different conditions, we can allow more mass spectrometers to use the library and just the one we built it on. And then we just add it in there, and now we have our personal library, which the people who published this uploaded to a public database for every world to use as we start to build a plant library. Okay. Katie, how we, what are we, when are we supposed to be done by two o'clock, right? Okay, cool. 
I'm right on schedule then. New feature in Combo Discoverer software is MZ Logic. <coughs> okay. And ideally, in Compound Discoverer, we would take our MS2 of our unknown compound, which produced a series of structures in a search by precursor mass. We would match it against our library, and it would match perfectly. Notice we don't get a perfect match, which means we have a similar compound, but we didn't identify that particular compound. So what we can do is we can say, huh, which compounds do we get close on? In this case, there was 441 compounds based upon this exact mass that were plausible with some kind of hits at all. So what MD logic part of Compound Discover can do is it can say, okay, I'm gonna take every single one of those 441 possible, what we call putative candidates, I'm going to match them against your unknown, and I'm going to plot number of them versus quality of the spore. And I'm going to rank them and say that, yes, your compound's not here, but these compounds are the best match. And when we do that, we take and drop down a lot. So instead of having to look at 441, we get about five structures which have just about the same score. And now, did we identify your proper compound? No, but we gave you a set of compounds to either purchase all five, the brute force approach, which sometimes is the easiest, or we gave you five structures which may have enough commonality for you to deduce what's different. What's the key word there in that last sentence? May. Okay, I want this very clear. What is the number one instrument when you want to say what is the structure of a chemical? If I give you an unknown that's pure and clean, what instrument are you going to run to? What? New. NMR. You want to know structure? You go to the NMR. The NMR builds structure, right? It's a structure builder. The NMR is not as sensitive, it's not as fast, but it builds true structure. And the NMR has got those cute little sidebands on every peak that tell us what? Connectivity, how one piece is attached to another piece. And that's what the mass spec lacks. The mass spec is incredible when we wanna say, of these five compounds, which is the correct one? But the mass spec is not a structure builder. Don't ever think you're just going to take an MS2 of a total unknown and you're going to do structure from it. That's very, very, very challenging. Sometimes you get lucky. And I see courses all the time. The person goes up, oh, look at this MS2. We've got this, 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 this. Boom, boom. Here's the structure. I do that all the time in my life. Do you know how that works? I've done that structure 200 times in my career. I've got the MS2 memorized. And of course, I could explain it once I know what it is. But if you hand me a, a total MS2 unknown, I want to tell you I got about a 5% chance of success and a good case. And that's having done mass spec for 25 years. Okay, so in the end, we're going to get a much smaller subset and we're going to get a quality score. Okay. And in this case, you can see we're really down to three compounds that are pretty similar in their score and pretty similar in their structures, okay? Just by moving a little, a little side piece around, pretty tough. And it shows you the common structures that it was based off of with literature references to see if that helps you. Now, I am not a statistician, but if you are, Compound Discover gives you about a thousand different ways to plot that data, very cool. Okay, and a lot of people really love that section of CDs, the ability to do all those painful plots in a nice, easy to do fashion. Okay, so here's an example, tryptophan. Okay, when we look over time, we can see the different changes. 
We click one button and we can see the change in the strains. We click two buttons and now we can see the differences in the strains and the times together. And you can click as many different study factors you want to group it all together. Okay, that's where you play with the data and hopefully you play in the right direction all of a sudden you're the one who makes the discovery that no one else has discovered before. Okay. I love PCA, but I cannot explain it. Oh my God, I'd love to meet someone who could really explain PCA and make me believe it. Okay, but it's so cool in this case where we can look at strains and see how they match. Okay, or we can look at time and see if the times group together. Okay, or we can look at strains and time together. There's a lot of cool things in the PCA plot. Okay, I want to end by looking at a little, little bit of data. Okay, this was a little... Uh, example, okay, we got some spleen samples, okay, where they were treated and not treated, okay. We're going to run the IDX, okay, I showed you earlier, one high resolution MS1 at 60,000. We got a few MS2s at 30,000. <coughs> we tell the instrument, I want no more than 1.8 seconds between my full of messes, so I get a nice extracted ion chromatogram. Okay. I'm going to use step occlusion energies, so that way I get a beautiful MS2, no matter what structure it is, mixed together. Okay. And then I'm going to turn on a choir X. I'm going to talk about choir X in a few seconds. Okay. So this is an example. Okay. <clears throat> Here's our blank. Okay. Here's our Electrospray positive for our native and our treated. You can see we get a lot of nice differences. Okay. There's negative to see more, more molecules. Generally, I see about 15% of my molecules in both positive and neg. Generally, one of the two works a little better than the other. And then I see about 85% of my molecules liking one or the other. And that's why I usually run both. Okay. The IDX with that high field Orby gives me the ability to choose a resolution, okay? I can get a lot of data points at 60, 120, 240. I still have close to 25 data points across that peak with beautiful definition. Even at 500,000 resolution where I drop down to about, about 12 data points, I still define that peak quite nicely, okay? So when, if you need fine structure, even on very large molecules like lipids, you can really do it on the Orbi quite easily just by upping the resolution. And on the Orbi, there's no effect of sensitivity versus resolution. It's just resolution versus how many data points do you want. Okay. And the nice thing is, here's an example of <coughs> you know, so homocysteine. Okay. Across the peak, we never break more than one ppm mass accuracy. Okay. We have a built, we have the ability, unlike the TOFs, we can either lock every single spectra as they're acquired off of a background peak. And if, the, and if you're in a lab that is so clean, I've never seen one of these labs, I want to, the air is so literally clean, there's not a single background peak in the air, then we can use easy IC and we can put a background peak in there for you. It won't affect anything, your option. The nice thing is, as your mass accuracy get lower and lower, your number of possible structures gets smaller and smaller that you've got to deal with. You have a smaller candidate space to search. Now, what is Acquire X? Acquire X is the ability to re-inject, okay, to rerun a sample in an automated fashion. So what Acquire X does is it runs the first day dependent injection, normal sample. Then it says of the number of full MSs with the number of features, did I get an MSMS for every feature? If you don't, which almost never happens, then it re-injects and it keeps a list of what features you already found. So you say it goes, okay, my first injection, I found 4,000 MS2s. In injection two, I'm not going to refragment those 4,000. I'm going to fragment 4,001 to 7,000. 
and injection three, I'm not going to fragment the first 4,000, the second 3,000. I'm going to MSMS the next 2,000. Now, you're saying, well, Craig, why is your numbers going down? As we go lower and lower into the sample, the return on investment drops. Oh, that wasn't, okay. Just because as they're smaller and smaller, it takes a little more time to accumulate them to get a good quality signal. So we can see, okay, with one reinjection, we go up about 10%. Two reinjections, about 20. And third reinjection is probably about your final point. You get about 28, 29% return. Okay. So if you want to discover more things, you turn on Acquire X and it says, okay, I keep track of what I saw and I don't see it again. Kind of a nice feature on our instruments. Okay. <clears throat> we had about one and a half times the number of good fragmentations with Acquire X. Okay. So we got a, we had about 3,900 compounds. Okay. In our spleen. Okay. We got MSMS. Okay. Normally about 1,900 of them, little, about half. When we go to Acquire X deep scanning, we get about another 50%. Okay. We go about 50% of our compounds up to about 75% of our compounds almost. And we go from about 172 matches to 198 using MZ Cloud Exact. And we get about 15 or 20% more using all of our different search techniques. Nice way to improve your data. Okay. And you can see the number of different ways using MZ Cloud, MZ Cloud Similarity, MZ Vault with a custom built database, Chem Spider, where we only have a level three ID and our annotations. And then we could do a nice little comparison of our spleen, okay, treated and non-treated, and we could definitely see a separation, okay? And we can break that separation down further if we want to, okay? With the Acquire X and the Vanquish HPLC, we get about two thirds of our compounds with a CV less than 20%, okay? Which is pretty good for biological replicates in this case with spleen extracts. Okay, we can do some volcano plots to see which compounds are changing with a good statistical significance, confidence, and take those for further biological exploration. Okay. And that's just another example of showing you how they differ both chromatographically and statistically. Okay, I want to take a few moments to thank Jean Co for inviting us. I want to thank Katie for bringing me along and allowing me to spend the day with you guys. Okay, if there's any questions that I can answer, okay. Uh, my job is two parts, I support Katie and I do customer training, customer support. If you ever purchase any consumable from Katie, from Thermo, from Fisher, that's a Thermo consumable. If you have any problems, please see Katie. She has an email address that comes to me and a few members of my group. And we will go out of our way to guarantee that you will be successful via replacement, via application support, whatever you need to succeed with thermal consumables. Okay? Questions, thoughts, or comments? I do not have a laboratory in my house, and I only have a portfolio for the stuff that you see. Then, when I learn the compound to discover, yeah, he does the formula to the school, he likes the action. But the same compound that comes out of the house, how I can judge that compound with the compound or Okay, so. When you're seeing the same name having different random times, that means that name is not guaranteed, okay? So that what's happened is instead of giving to a level one where we know which of those particular peaks has the exact correct structure, we're sitting at a level two where they're all possibles and we don't know which is the true one. 
Okay, that's when you're gonna need to go purchase that compound and see which one he actually is. So that means that your accurate mass and your MSMS were not good enough against whatever things you searched to identify it correctly. Okay. I wouldn't report that one. When I get multiples, I don't report them or I report them at a level two or three, whatever I succeed, but I don't report them at level one because I don't know which one's the correct one. Okay. I don't think it's correct. A lot of people will co-ed the areas. So customers will say to me, well, you know, what if they're confirmations? Well, if we think of chromatography, confirmations will produce either doublets or slight separations. If that peak separates well, that's not confirmations. That's a different structure altogether. Yes. Yeah. No, you got to go purchase the standard and you got to use that. No, you can't tell. This is why I go back to the fact that typically I quantify about 10 times more compounds than I identify. Yep. You still got to go back and purchase in the end. Yes. Yep. Okay. So you show us about creating a story. Uh -huh. Is it possible to have some AI feature that? So, um, the AI feature of library building is called Mass Frontier. Okay. So when you see, um, um, MZ Cloud. MZ Cloud is the database structure of Mass Frontier. Mass Frontier is the tools that Thermal uses to automatically build the MZ Cloud library and to automatically take that data, assign them to structures, and do those structures make sense. And there's about, I don't know, about 30 modules and a nice AI interface at the end that brings them all together. Okay. And if you want to understand Mass Frontier, you want to meet up with Mandy Bowman, my group. And she's a Mass Frontier expert. Okay. Now, if I had to estimate success of the Mass Frontier, it's around about 75%. So we find if we look at the tens of thousands of compounds in MZ Cloud, about 75% of those were built purely by Mass Frontier. And when we had a professional organic chemists with at least 10 years of experience doing it, look at those, they agreed. And about 25% of the time, we will see that the Mass Frontier score is out of our normal confidence range. And that means that it got lost and that it needs help from an organic chemist. Okay, and about, in, in about it's down to about five or 10% time we just have the wrong compound in our library. And now we realize that what we thought was a reference compound is not correct. Yes, keep going. <laughs> yep, Hypercell Gold and the C30, yep. Correct. Hillock. If, if you said to me, I only get one injection, yep. I'm going to do Hillock and I'm going to do it pause neg switching and I'm going to cross my fingers. Okay. The reason I say that is the, um, the Hillock yep. takes a sample in organic, generally like a methanol works pretty well, a little acid, maybe a synod trial. It'll handle that pretty well without fronting. And the organic will probably give you a greater chance of getting that complex sample solubilized and onto the instrument itself. Okay. Yeah, so the base of my instrument, You're clogging it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> put in front of it a um, put in front of it a uh, 
put in front of it a titanium frit. Um, you know that part from the finger tight accessories, that little, the little silver one. Put, yeah, the little, put the little filter in front of it. Is the filter clogged or is the column clogged? Yes. Okay. Then you're gonna. Then you got to go back to sample prep, and you you got to filter your samples. Okay. You've got particulate. So the key to clogging is there's two types of, of clogging on a column. There's particulate, and particulate clogs happen fast. You were running, running, running. Column's looking great. You injected a sample. All of a sudden, the column just stops within within half a minute of the auto sampler injecting. The column's dead. That's particulate. You put a filter in front. And the filter saves the column, but the LC run is still done because the filter clogs up. But now you know you got particulate and you've got to call Katie and she will sell you different types of filtration to get rid of that particulate. Or you got to spin down, spin downing, spinning, spin downing. Spinning down a sample is scary to me because the minute you spin it down, it is great. And then you sit there trying to pipette it into your, into your vial, and a lot of times you resuspend your problem and you go back to clogging. Now, the other type of clog is organic. This is not instantaneous. Your column pressure just slowly creeps up. This is deposition of stuff that was soluble, but will never elude off that column, okay? You run the C18 column, okay, with the acetonitrile, you leave behind all the fats and lipids and they just slowly change your C18 to C172, C1276. As it's accumulating those fats and lipids and change from C18 to something much longer. Then you want to explore MB124, Michael Bravo 124. It's a, you can buy it from Fisher, okay? Or you can make it yourself. It's just a simple mixture of 45% isopropanol, 45% acetonitrile, 10% acetone. That will strip the column of all this organic crap. When I run samples that you guys send in our collaboration, every 10th injection is MB124 to keep my column clean. Okay. Yep, makes sense. With the filter? Without the filter, crew. You can sometimes take that column, reverse it. And sometimes you can take the start off. Katie, what was the key word in that sentence I used several times? Sometimes. I want this clear. You take a column and you pressurize it to 1,000 bar, which is 15,000 PSI. Sometimes you embed that particles right into the frit. I don't care how much you reverse it. Those things are not coming off. They've been compacted and that column has to go in the garbage. Now, let's say you just bought a thousand dollar column. Okay, and on the first day, you have a bad day. You go, Katie, I clogged it up on the first column. I'm, you're gonna email me. I'm gonna call Katie, I'm gonna say, are you a good customer of Thermo? She goes, God, Jin buys everything. He, he, he never calls about problems. I have no problem, I'll send you an FOC. Uh, out of my expense, not Katie's, not sales, I'll send you a replacement. The third time you do that, I'm going to tell you, sorry, I mentioned the filter, you got to explore it. Yes. Okay. Sample prep is the key. Infiltration is the number one step to avoid your problems. Okay. Guard columns are the number two. They'll prevent the organic buildup. Okay. They'll slow down the column's death, but they won't prevent it. Okay. Is filtration. Yep, filtration is the most important. Oh, that's all you need is a syringe filter. The the little um the four millimeter ones were great. You can just push your samples right through them. Okay, they're dirt cheap. Katie can sell you a big container of them. Okay.